Hello, and thank you to everybody who has joined so far. We are going to give uh, everybody about one more minute, and then we will get started on our webinar. Okay, welcome everyone and good evening. Thank you for attending our webinar, Brown University's Online Master of Public Health FAQs. My name is Katie and I will be moderating this evening. So to get things started, let's quickly review the agenda and then I will introduce you to our panelists for this evening. So we know many of you are here and eager to learn more about the application process and we will certainly cover that in depth. Before we do, though, you are going to hear directly from Brown faculty about what makes this program unique. And after that, we will cover the most common questions we get about the application, like what the requirements are, if there are scholarships and other waivers available, etc. And then at the end of our webinar, we will have a live Q&A session. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A icon. If at any time during this webinar you have a question, feel free to click on that button and type your question into the pop up that appears. At the end of the webinar, we will address those questions. Now, many of you also submitted questions during the registration process, and we will absolutely be sure to do our best to address those as well. So with that said, let me introduce you to your panelists this evening. Today, we are joined by some of Brown University's experts on the online Master of Public Health. So first up, we have Matt Wallace, who is the Assistant Director of Student Recruitment and Marketing. Now, Matt has been with Brown for three years and has served in many other enrollment positions prior to joining the team. And he helps with all graduate students who attend. So he knows the application requirements and process front to back. Next, we have Dr. Jennifer Nazarino, who is the Online Master of Public Health's Inaugural Associate Director. And Dr. Nazarino has been with Brown for five years and has a long history in the public health in industry with prior experience in long-term care and healthcare-related systems. In addition to her work as a Brown faculty member, she is also co-director of the Philippine Health Initiative for Research, Service, and Training. So we are certainly very lucky to benefit from her expertise this evening. And last but absolutely not least tonight, we are joined by Kim Pulaski, who is an enrollment coach here at Brown University. Kim has worked in higher education for 13 years and has spent much of that time helping adults who enroll in graduate programs. Now, Kim and her fellow enrollment coaches are experts on the Brown application and are available to help all of our prospective students with their questions. And she has a lot of expertise to share tonight that I'm sure everyone will find helpful. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to these three experts to take it from here. So Jen, can you kick us off, please? Definitely. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad that you're with us uh, today to talk more about our um, exciting new online MPH program at Brown University. So what makes it unique? So the first thing is I want to give some background really quickly about prior to um, being a faculty member, um, my background in public health is also in social work. And I worked in hospital settings. I worked for one of the biggest uh, county hospitals in the United States, as well as working for um, working in uh, the UK at, in their NHS system and working as a social worker and working with refugee families, as well as immigrant minoritized uh, populations in both county both the county hospitals in the US as well as working in the, the UK system and their NHS system. And what I really want to impress is that the role of case-based learning, there was nothing like learning from real world cases to really get a grasp of what's happening on the ground through public health practice. And so that is why that is a big component of our program is to include in every, in all your courses, this notion of having cases, real world cases to learn from and for for students to talk about and learn about from their experiences and that's what's so exciting about this program is because most mh mph programs do not in, involve and uh, do not really bring in case-based learning um, at the forefront and so that's something really exciting that we're doing here at brown 
It's 100% online. Asynchronous courses provide you flexibility. Also, it's just you can go at your own pace. You can learn it. You, you can learn you, you how you as a learner can use the asynchronous courses to really, uh, you know, learn on your own time. And so the optional synchronous weekly session meetings with faculty, that's really critical, too. That's important to have live sessions uh, with faculty member, your faculty member that will be teaching um, the courses. But again, that is optional, it's highly encouraged, but it's definitely available once a week for you to meet with your faculty member. The curriculum, we're excited about the curriculum because we're particularly focused on building the new public health leaders for the future. I, and I think COVID-19 has really impressed upon us the role that public health has to play as leaders. And we are very um, focused on creating uh, coursework and, and curriculum on leadership. And one important point um, is that I want to bring up is that one of the faculty members that will be teaching your leadership course um, is actually someone with a public health degree, but also an attorney and is a CEO and president of New England, New England um, Donor Services. And, and what I, we love is that we have faculty members that actually are on the ground leading public health um, systems, public health centers, public health organizations. And so you will be learning from actual leaders that have this kind of experience. Um, in terms of small class sizes, that's really critical here at Brown University. You will be learning with, uh, you'll be br be brought in into smaller cohorts so that you can learn from your, your peers and that the small cohort size will allow for that really getting to know your um, your classmates, as well as knowing your professors. And another important point that I really want to stress upon is this competitive price point. And so I also serve as a director of diversity, equity, inclusion for one of my um, faculty, um, a department that I have, I have a faculty appointment at. And <clears throat> no matter how you dress it up, diversity, equity, inclusion, it's important, but cost is important. Price matters. It matters not just for the individual that's thinking of applying to a master's program, but to, for, for the whole family. It's a huge investment. And so $60,000, I would argue, and I've done the benchmarking, I've done the, <laughs> the marketing analysis around this, is a very competitive price point. And I would say particularly we're um, very cost effective or much um, uh, it's just at a much more cost-effective price point compared to um, our competitors, as well as particularly in the Ivy Leagues. And so that's what I think is just some of the many wonderful um, things that is unique about our online MPH program. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, and I just want to reiterate uh, what Katie and Jen said is thank you for being here. I mean, we are in the middle of the most important public health moment of our lifetimes. And uh, the coolest thing is that Brown University is really meeting this moment with innovation and leadership from, from Jen in particular, as, as an example, uh, and from skill and compassion. And that's why you're here. I mean, the world needs public health professionals more than it ever has before. We have a lot of different crises happening right now. And so it's just so encouraging. And we're just so over the moon psyched that you're here uh, to learn a little bit more about the online MPH program, our brand new program. To think that you could get, you know, a Brown University quality education um, online is just so incredible. And it just speaks to how, you know, it's, it's part of the Brown ethos is to be accessible, you know, accessible to everyone. And, and this is part of that, you know, we want uh, to have the best and brightest students from around the world, even if you live in Providence, you know, we, but you're working full time. We want you to be able to get this high quality education and be able to balance your life. Now you may not have a life going to work full time and, and going to school full time, but it's all worth it in the end. Uh, so uh, we're just happy that you're you're here with us today. And um, speaking of accessible around the world, I would like to ask everybody, if you can, to let us know where you're joining us from. So in, in the chat, if you can just go ahead and type in, you know, the city, state, country that you're joining us from, that would be awesome so we can see where everybody is uh, 
is joining us from. So go ahead and do that now. Go ahead and type in where you're from. New York City, Cape Cod, another New York, North Providence, see, like, right. from us, very cool. Atlanta, going to Atlanta in, in a month, going to Morehouse um, to speak there. Oklahoma, family from Oklahoma, Boston, very cool. Very cool. So, so as you can see, oh, Tokyo, Nepal. Wow. Awesome. Very cool. I, we appreciate you participating. Because um, as you can see, I mean, public health is such a, a global pursuit. Um, so it'll take the world working together and collaborating um, to, to really um, make a difference in people's lives and save lives. So anyway, uh, now that that uh, is said, I know that you came here, you want to know the, the bones, what, what to do, how do I get in, what is this application process, education likes to make things a lot more confusing than they need to be, so that's why we're here to help you um, through all the steps and let you know exactly what you need to have a competitive um, application and be able to be accepted at Brown, so um, in order to apply you need to have your bachelor's degree. You need to have two years of professional experience prior to the start date. So if you're like a year and a half, but you're going to be at around two years when you start, that's cool. You need three letters of recommendation. Now, SOFAs can accept up to five, but uh, you just need three. It's, it's better to have three really strong letters of recommendation than five so-so letters of recommendation. So just to let you know that. Um, official transcripts from all the colleges and universities that you've attended. So even if you've transferred credit over to a college, you have to submit the transcripts from each college that you attended. Um, application fee, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, of course, a completed application in SOFAs. And then international applicants may need to submit proof of language proficiency, depending um, on certain criteria. And then also for international um, applicants, a West transcript uh, evaluation might be necessary if you earned your uh, degree internationally. And we can talk more about that too. I got muted. So question, was I muted that whole time? Please tell me I was not muted that entire time. No, you were. You were. Goodness. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So <laughs> I think I would have gotten a warning sign somehow. So um, I'm glad I wasn't. So is assistance available for the application fees? So you know how Jen mentioned before, cost is a barrier. We want to make this education accessible. And one of the first barriers is that that application fee. And quite frankly, it's not cheap. It's $140 through SOFAs. So it's not our application fee. It's SOFAs application fee. But every all the applications go through SOFAs. So um, Katie is actually going to share. Yep. Katie just shared a, a link, which is great. Thank you so much, Katie, for doing that. So you have an opportunity um, to get that application fee waived. So Brown University School of Public Health has its own application fee waiver. They're limited. We don't have a million of these things, um, but they're great. You can apply for it super easy. If you've been a part of an initiative, a program, a conference that have been aimed to um, develop education programs and make education accessible for diverse students or students with need, um, then you can qualify for it. And uh, you can go ahead and fill it out and then just make sure that you're kind of closer to finishing your application when you do, because you only have two weeks um, to submit your application fee waiver once you're awarded it. So um, just make sure that you'll be able to finish your application within those two weeks. And then if you don't get awarded an application fee waiver from Brown, you can always go through SOFAs as well. SOFAs has an application fee waiver. It's on that same link that was shared. And SOFAs has an um, application fee waiver for international students, service-based, and then also uh, for need-based as well. So there are options available for you. And I will uh, turn things back over to Jen. So who should I, uh, who should you ask to write a letter of recommendation? And so 
definitely the best people to ask are people that you're currently um, working with, such as your, your current boss, or you maybe even a former boss, so a peer, um, a former academic leader, or, or, you know, like a professor that you um, have taken a, courses with. And um, those are some of the folks that I we would suggest that you would ask for a letter of recommendation. Again, as uh, Matt said, you know, we would want three very strong letters of rec, but I think, Matt, as you said, there, there's an opportunity to turn in at least five, uh, max five. All right, so your personal statement. This is really the way you can differentiate yourself from the other applicants. And um, the coolest thing about Brown is that uh, the, the application review process is so holistic. You know, you're, you're not just a number, you know, there's not minimums or anything like that. We, we look at you as, a, as an entire human being, as an entire person to see if you're a good fit. It's so much less of, hey, is this person good enough for Brown? It's much more, hey, are we good enough for this applicant? Are we good enough for you? Do we have the faculty? Do we have the research? Do we have the resources? Do we have the connections? Do we have the education that fits your needs and your goals? So that's really what we're looking for um, in your personal statement. We want you to, we want to hear why you're passionate about public health. Uh, that, that's really what it is. And, and I think it's important for you to maybe say a little bit about, you know, um, your background, what you plan on, uh, on doing while you're at Brown, and then maybe what some of your goals are after Brown. Uh, one of the beauties of an MPH is it's almost like a Swiss Army knife, right, of skill sets that you can have. So you can go into healthcare, you can um, work for a nonprofit, you can go into academia. Uh, there's just so many different things that you can do uh, with an MPH. So just let us know what your interests are and, and we'll see if you're a good fit. There are a lot of great schools of public health out there and everyone is different. Um, so you wanna fit what you, you know, you wanna find what, you know, best fits you. This is asked a lot and it's a great question about professional experience and says, do I really need two years of work experience? And so uh, just following along what Matt uh, has just mentioned, we're looking at your application holistically. Yes, we do really want uh, you to bring in some, some work experience because I think it would lead to such great conversations amongst your peers, that you've been on the ground, that you've worked in a public health setting or want to pivot, but have been in the workforce for at least two years. We understand that, you know, I've gotten that question, well, what if it's one and a half or what if I did part-time work? Put it all in there. We will definitely happy to read through it. Um, some of you have worked during your undergrad, you know, I definitely did when I was an undergrad student, definitely uh, had to hold a job at the same time. And so we appreciate that and we understand that. So again, um, we, I want to stress that we read your application and we think about uh, you holistically and the different experiences that you bring um, as an applicant. Okay, my turn. Hello, everybody. I would uh, just like to echo what Matt and Jen said. We are incredibly proud of this online MPH program, and we're super happy to um, offer it to you guys. Um, it's super exciting, too, because this is our inaugural uh, session, right? Like September 7th, we're kicking this off. So we are in the enrollment phase for uh, September 7th right now. So those of you who are inquiring, applying, uh, you're in such a really unique, uh, special place with this particular program. And I just happen to notice a few of my students in particular are here tonight. So thank you for joining us. I appreciate that. Um, scholarships. This is a huge question. I get this every single conversation. So here's what's in place right now. Merit-based scholarships. These are applicable for the very first year of the program. Uh, the staff will be figuring out what applies for the second and or third year of your program. But for now, merit-based scholarships range from 33% to 50% to 100%. And the way it's working is when um, the review committee looks at your, your application to consider you for acceptance into the program, they're also going to be looking at what, if anything, they're going to award you for a scholarship. 
So the way you're going to find out is when you get the decision back from the review committee, you will also, if you're accepted, you'll also be notified if you have received the scholarship and what that looks like. I don't know if Matt, you wanted to add anything else of, of, as far as scholarships are concerned. Matt. Yeah, sorry, I was, I was answering Jillian's <laughs> question. So um, yeah, absolutely. So there are a lot of different ways that you can fund your education. So Kim mentioned um, the scholarship that you automatically are um, evaluated for, which is awesome. No additional paperwork or anything like that, which is, which is that's the best kind. Right? Uh, and then the other kinds, uh, there's a lot of great scholarships through ASPPH. I'm going to actually share that link here with everybody in the chat. Um, so ASPPH is great because there's scholarships for, for international students, for um, uh, students from different uh, citizenships, students that are part of like minority or underserved populations or groups, um, applicant specific criteria, and so many more. Um, and then there's also loans. So you can also um, take out loans. That's not the most exciting way, but I'll, I'll go ahead and um, at federal loans and then private loans as well if you're an international student. These are all ways to fund your education. So um, lots of opportunities for you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Matt, I appreciate it. Okay, so enrollment coaches, that's, that's my role. Uh, there are three of us uh, enrollment coaches. There's myself, uh, Amanda and Katie are the three main enrollment coaches for this program. Some of you may have spoken with Nikki. She is our, our backup in cases uh, where we desperately need somebody to help assist us. But really our goal and our, our role is to help address your questions, your concerns, go through the information a little bit more specifically to you. I think it makes a big difference from reading it on the page to having an actual discussion and how this particular program breaks down and how it applies to you specifically. So if you're getting those calls or those text messages, those emails, definitely encourage you to just kind of respond. Let us help you. That's what we're here for is to help you, not bug you. Um, but we want to be able to support you in your educational goals. And I can assure you that all three of us know what we're doing. And we are very committed to this program and to your education. Maybe two out of the three of us know what we're doing, but. I, I meant us enrollment coaches. Oh. <laughs> Matt, you know what you're doing. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much uh, to all of our panelists for your expertise. Now we'll have our, our Q&A session. I see that Matt is replying to some questions one-on-one, uh, uh, -on -one, so we can address them that way. As a reminder, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A icon. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them into the pop-up that appears there, but we will address some that we have already received uh, first. So Kim, this first question is for you. Um, this person wants to know if it's recommended to work while being enrolled in the master's degree. That, that's a great question. Um, this particular full um, online master's and MPH is actually specifically designed for full-time working adults. So the structure, and I know, um, I believe it was Jen had covered this a little bit. The structure overall is you take two classes every semester that do run concurrently. The time commitment expectation is about 20 to 25 hours a week. So when I mention that to people, um, first of all, that is still a full-time student, <laughs> but you are working a full-time job. Um, so when I mention that to people, I think most people think I have to take three or four classes to be a full-time student in this. You don't. It is, it is specifically designed for full-time working adults. Okay, thank you so much, Kim. Um, Jen, I'm gonna send this next question to you. It looks like in the registration, uh, Zoom registration, we've got a few, quite a few questions about customization. Um, so will there be other concentrations available or customizations to add to this particular degree? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Katie. So as of right now, this it's a generalist concentration uh, for the online MPH. In the in-person program, though, we do have um, more concentrations um, such as epidemiology, biostatistics, um, global health. You can definitely, though, that's, I mean, since we just initiated and started this program, we are starting with more of a generalist MPH at this time. Thank you, Jen. And since you were on the topic, I'm gonna to send you the next question too. And this person wants to know uh, the difference between the on-ground MPH and the online MPH. So the, the main difference is that you don't have to move. We, we come to you. We come to you. We, we understand that uh, we are fo focused on providing an online MPH program for those, those students that have full-time jobs, that can't leave their job, can't leave their family or their partner or spouse, can't also relocate. And so that's the, that's the main, major difference, right? And then also the flexibility that you can, again, since it's um, asynchronous and synchronous learning, you can, you can pace yourself, you can learn on your own time. And that's, that's the beauty of being able to do this from virtually, um, where not not everyone can just pick up their lives and move to the Northeast. And we're really trying to be much more accessible. Thank you so much. So this next, we have two questions that are interrelated and I'm gonna throw these to Kim and Jen to tag team. Uh, the first is, do, do is there a set schedule for the class or uh, is it on your own pace and kind of your own schedule? Um, and then will there be exams or are the courses more project-based? So kind of two similar questions. Um, I'll take the first question, Jen, if you wanna take the second one. Um, so this particular program is, is set up in an asynchronous style. And um, Jen had mentioned that early on. So asynchronous meaning each week you're gonna get your specific assignments. You're gonna have videos to watch, uh, recorded lectures, reading assignments, whatever the instructor has planned for that week, and you will have specific deadlines to meet each week. So you wanna make sure you're paying attention to that, but you get on and get your work done when it's convenient for you, like Jen mentioned. So the point of this flexibility is to allow somebody who works the night shift to be able to do their homework early in the morning, or to allow uh, somebody who does nine to five get off work, put the kids to bed and do their work at 10 o'clock at night. Whatever works best for the individual student um, is how this is designed. But also like Jen mentioned, there is that weekly discussion meeting. It's not mandatory, but it is highly encouraged for you to attend because you get to drink in all the knowledge of not only your classmates, but the Brown faculty that is gonna be working through this program. So I'll add to, thanks Kim for that. So I'll add to, in terms of exams and, and um, uh, dirt certain projects. So what we've learned from just uh, looking at other programs and really thinking through what, how, how best, what are some best practices around online learning? And what we really want to, uh, what we did infuse is this notion of low stakes exams. So it's instead of having one huge exam that is 50% of your grade, we're gonna instead um, implement uh, weekly or bi-weekly exams that it's just, it, it just in terms of you really learning the, the terms, the, the, bio, the biostats formulas, but learning weekly and bi-weekly instead of like thinking of a midterm and it being such a big percentage of your grade. And so they're gonna, there's gonna be exams, but it's much more low stakes in terms of the percentages. Also, it's much more, we wanna in, involve more yeah, your peers and develop more project-based learning and working together in teams. I think that's really important. And like flipping the classroom and having uh, students learn from each other and faculty learning from you all. So it's not very individually based. It's very much focused on developing projects uh, where you work with teams as well, again, as like low stakes exams. Thank you. And as a follow up to this, that uh, your answers, this person would like to know if what time the um, weekly discussions are scheduled for. 
So that's what we would, based on um, our first cohort, we will figure out a, a we will figure out a time that works for um, everyone. That that we would probably put the fact like I will be teaching uh, one of the courses. I'll most likely put out a doodle a doodle poll and say what time frame works for you all because I want to I want to meet you. I want to see you. I want you to come into my synchronous sessions and I want to learn about your background and i want to be there to answer any questions that you have uh, have any from my course um videos or multimedia vi uh, videos that i'll be pr producing but i want to be able to be available to you all to um so i'm happy to be very flexible around figuring out what time works and so will our other faculty members great thank you now kim i'm not sure if this is for you or jen so again uh, you can tag team this Matt, I'm sure we'll find something to throw your way soon. Uh, but is there an option to take one or two classes per term? Or is there a requirement to take two classes every term? So that's a great question. And we actually get that question quite often. Can I accelerate the program? Can I take more? Can I take less if I need to? So um, Jen, please correct me if I'm wrong. But this is what I say. <laughs> Um, I say you need to expect to start with two classes. That's not negotiable initially. But after that, um, they will look at a case by case basis as far as either accelerating your coursework um, or decelerating the coursework, knowing that you have to complete everything within five years. Um, and some of that is going to be contingent on availability of certain classes that come up next in your schedule. How'd I do, Jen? That sounds great. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next question uh, is going to be for, I think, Matt and Kim. And that is, when do graduate students usually apply for financial aid? So I would definitely apply. I mean, uh, so the program, uh, is financial aid, you know, you can apply for loans, but we don't, we're not offering need-based aid um, for this first cohort, but I would definitely apply uh, either before you apply um, to your, uh, to the program or shortly afterwards. So you can coordinate all those uh, payments when it's time to uh, pay tuition. And I'll, I'll just piggyback on that if you don't mind. So the cool thing about FAFSA, if that's what you're using for to pay for school, you can apply anytime with FAFSA and it just sits there and it waits for you to start school. <laughs> so just know that right now is the right time to go ahead and apply for FAFSA and just knock that out. Perfect. Thank you, Kim. Now, Matt, here's another question for you, and that is, do internships or volunteer experience count toward the two years of work experience requirement? Yeah, this one might be a little bit better for Jen. I, I would say is this if it's relative um, work experience, I, I think it counts. Um, Jen, is that right? Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah, so that's what I would say. So, so you could be an undergrad and you could be working and you could be working in an internship. Um, and, uh, you know, like we mentioned before, it's a very holistic process. You know, we're not, we're not just looking, okay, two years experience, okay, you just have that, so you're in. We really want you to just be a good fit for the program and mm -hmm. set up for success. That's what, that's what these requirements are based on. It's not just to um, be arbitrary barriers, but to, so once you're in the program that you're set up for success. Perfect, thank you. So just a time, uh, time check for everybody who has joined. We will take about five more minutes of questions. So if you have some, put them in the chat and we will see what we can address. Um, but in the interim, there are some, uh, some kind of similar questions that we have, uh, which are, what are the opportunities to uh, network with the group? Um, and how do we envision, uh, Jen, I think this is probably a question for you, but how do you envision kind of the interaction and collaboration between students in each cohort? Yeah, so that this is really important. That is, for us is that really creating these spaces for you to all network with your peers um, from 
around the country and around the world? And how do you in your specific region uh, are facing certain public health challenges? I think that is what's so critical and important is creating that type of dialogue, right? And also thinking about interventions around that and what works and what doesn't work in your respective area. So that's critical. Another thing is about networking with faculty, you know, working with faculty. Uh, and, and that's what's so wonderful about this program is that you'll be learning from faculty that also do research, uh, how, from global health to more domestic based issues, and you'll have access to that faculty to work with them around interventions, evaluations, but also the, re potentially research with them as well, if that's something that you're interested in. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have a few questions about the uh, personal essay. Um, can you, Matt, it looks like you may have answered this privately, but can you expand one more time on how long the personal uh, personal statement should be? Yeah, absolutely. So we don't require a minimum or maximum length for the personal statement, uh, but we're also now looking for a novel or a narrative. Uh, so I think uh, after speaking to a lot of the faculty reviewers and evaluators, I think the sweet spot is around 500 to 750 um, words. You want to be as succinct as possible while also being able to share, you know, your academic, professional, and uh, personal accomplishments. Perfect. Thank you. And how long uh, does it typically take to find out if you were accepted after you apply? So I'll take that. So we are um, starting to um, we have rolling admissions now. And so what's what's really great about that is that we're really hoping to get decisions between four to six weeks back to you. It's because I know that you're also applying to other programs. You're trying to think through what works for you and your life. And so that's, you know, we understand that. And so that is why we have implemented rolling admissions. And you can hear you, we play, you, you will get a decision within four to six weeks. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so the next question is regarding scholarship options. Obviously we covered a few options that we have uh, for this cohort, uh, but is there any more information available about opportunity after the first cohort? And I'll throw that one to, I guess, Matt or Kim, if you're, if you're familiar. So scholarship opportunities like need-based scholarship after the first cohort, it's definitely something that um, we're always working on uh, trying to make, you know, our education as accessible as possible and provide as many scholarship opportunities as possible. Um, so for, for this cohort, the merit scholarship can cover anywhere between, I think it's 33 and 100%. Um, not everybody will, will get that scholarship, but Unfortunately, we weren't able to implement the need-based scholarship uh, for, for this first cohort, but it's definitely something that we are going to work towards. Thank you. And then this is the last question that we will take for the evening, um, and then we will uh, wrap things up. And that is from Tracy. There's a transcript entry section in SOFAS that costs $69 for th three transcripts or a choice to enter them yourself. Can you help us understand that SOFAS requirement, uh, Matt? Is this required in order to submit, submit your application? No, it just saves you time, essentially. Uh, uh, SOFAS, yeah, it's SOFAS is something else. I, I don't wanna get on my soapbox on SOFAS, but um, yeah, so essentially you have to input each and every one of your classes individually. And SOFAs offers a service where they can kind of do it for you for a fee. Um, so depending on if you wanna you know, take advantage of that, you can, um, if not, you don't need to. Okay, thank you so much. So thank you, Kim, Matt, and Jen for your expertise, for your candor. I'm sure everybody on the call really appreciates it. And that um, concludes our webinar for this evening. So we have recorded all of your questions and our enrollment coaches are available to help answer those. If we didn't get a chance to, to get around to them this time around, or if you have more, um, please reach out to us, uh, the phone number or email address listed in the chat. I will put it in there one more time for you. Uh, so it's easy to access. 
Our enrollment coaches can help you with everything on your application. Uh, and so they're eager and willing to, to be of assistance. Uh, just a couple of upcoming deadlines that we'd like to remind everybody of. Uh, first of all, our priority application deadline is May 15th. And the final deadline is June 1st. And we really urge you to quickly get your application in so that you can receive an admissions deadline, uh, learn more about scholarship opportunities, and so that you're ready to begin classes with us in September. And that is all that we have to cover for this evening. So thank you again for everyone who has joined and for your engagement and your, and your enthusiasm about this program. And we hope to talk to you soon and have a nice evening.